When I was a child, I used to be very taken up with the reading of the Passion stories, especially during Lent, Palm Sunday, Good Friday. And I used to always think that, that I wanted to be alive at the time of Jesus because I wanted to be the person who would try to help Jesus out. And then as I began to mature in my faith, I began to realize, thank God I did not live during the time of Jesus. And the reason is because as we grow older, we become certain kinds of individuals. And honestly, if the trajectory that I had followed in my life was indeed what I followed, maybe, just maybe, I could have been the person who may have thrown the stone at Jesus or condemned him or made it worse for him. I don't know which way it would have gone. But I'm very relieved that I am living 2,000 years after the suffering, the death and the resurrection of Jesus so that I can look back and perhaps live a life today that would be a lot more thought out, a lot more intentional, a lot more like Christ. Not there yet, but. So it's a grace that for myself that I'm living much after Christ. And I'm not saying that you have to follow my prescription for it. You can decide for yourself how you want to place yourself in light of the life of Christ, but I'm grateful that I'm living it afterwards and not then. Part of the reason why I began my homily this way is because uh, for the past few days, we've been reading from the woes of Jesus, the seven woes, and I said yesterday in my reflection that in many ways, these seven woes are a striking parallel to the Beatitudes. So if you really want to compare who we are becoming, it's a good way to look at the Beatitudes and look at the woes and see where do I find myself more. And this is my fear. And I think there are many parts of my life which perhaps what Christ would say to me, come on, Satish, let's move on. I don't know if Christ would say woe to me. Maybe Christ would. But in so many ways, I want to be further along in forming myself as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we have the last of the two for the woes for today, where, and it's, it's hard to hear that, isn't it? Words like that from Jesus' mouth. So Jesus continues with some of the strongest words of denunciation that we would ever hear from his mouth. But I don't want us to get lost in the denunciation because we have to balance it out against Jesus in relationship, not just to the Pharisees and the scribes, but to all the people. And have you noticed that Jesus always has words of tenderness and forgiveness for sinners? The fallen, the weak, even that adulterous woman. There were just words of tenderness and non-condemnation, yet gently prodding them to a life of holiness. But he's unbending with the scribes and Pharisees. And the reasons that emerge from the seven woes seem to be that they're living a life of willful deceit. In other words, somehow they should have known that the path they were on uh, was inauthentic. Jesus has a problem with them because they become obsessed with all kinds of legalities. And they try to win human approval. It's all about human approval. They're like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside, full of dead people's bones and every kind of filth. It's because they are insincere. It's because 
they are pretentious whose outward acts and inner disposition just don't add up and they seem to be inconsistent in how they judge themselves as opposed to people this inconsistency is probably the most difficult thing for Jesus to handle so in light of these woes what do we want to make of these readings especially today as well folks christian discipleship christian discipleship is about putting on the heart of god christian discipleship is about putting on the heart of god and we know what the heart of god looks like because we know what the heart of jesus looks like tenderness and forgiveness for the wall for the fallen and the weak that's the heart of god but yet absolute distaste for pretentiousness for lack of integrity Jesus is the heart of God. Jesus is our model. Now, you know that in my own personal spiritual life, I have I have made the sermon on the mount the focus of my entire life as a priest and as a Christian disciple. And so I keep repeating this to myself and I keep repeating to our people but if we really want to know the heart of Jesus we must understand the beatitudes and the sermon on the mount we simply must in my estimation to to try to live christian discipleship without focusing on the sermon on the mount in some way is 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 is, is almost making half an attempt at discipleship because thank god matthew reveals to us the crux of christian character the beatitudes reveal the character of a disciple who must we become it's not what we do it's who we become but more than anything else the beatitudes reveal the character of jesus it reveals the heart of god and that is why the gospel is meant to be transformative and this is jesus's problem with the pharisees that in spite of god himself standing in front of them in spite of having a peek into the heart of god that simply was no transformation this is my fear about myself too what would would i have allowed myself to be transformed by the life of jesus lived right right in front of me and what if i had missed it maybe i would have been the worst of the pharisees and scribes this is my fear I have a greater chance of transformation now than I probably would have had would have had then. So the gospel is meant to be transformative. Folks, we come for mass week after week, sometimes day after day. What is happening to us? Who are we becoming? Are we becoming a people transformed? Are we becoming a people shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ? see sometimes religion can become a sidekick something that we do to pacify our own souls to convince ourselves that ah eh, we're not that bad people at least i'm not as bad as mrs jones who lives next door you know and that's not what religion is our faith must transform us into people who have the very heart of jesus each day the gospels invite us to be transformed and become like the christ who receive who we receive in the eucharist so i pray that each one of us will have the humility to allow christ to transform us people of god said